Okay. The next item of business is a debate on motion 9379 in the name of Liam MacArthur on finance. May I ask those who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Over time, most governors, uh, governments are eventually overwhelmed. Mr MacArthur, could you move your microphone nearer to you? Thank you. That's better. Over time, most governments are eventually overwhelmed by the weight of the promises they make. Initially faced with public anger on any issue, ministers will happily blame the previous administration before going on to faithfully promise that everything will be different from now on. Of course, this SNP government has raised the bar on blaming others. Shoulders just don't get much slopier. But it has also racked up its fair share of promises too over the past decade in trying at times to be all things to all people in pursuit of independence. From day one, SNP ministers have carpeted the country in love bombing. The length and breadth of Scotland, they have popped up here, there and everywhere, offering assurances that they will sort things out. To be clear, politicians getting out and about is a good thing, particularly so for ministers uh, most at risk of ivory tower syndrome. Over time, though, the promises, the nods and winks offered to find favour for political ends start to mount up. Individually, they may be deliverable. Collectively, they are not. The more this carries on, the more it speaks to a cynicism at the heart of government, playing one interest off against the other, kicking the can down the road, redefining each commitment as the reckoning approaches. This is not acceptable. It is treating people and communities with contempt, and it is where Parliament has a responsibility to stand firm. I appreciate that most colleagues don't live and breathe uh, lifeline ferry services like myself and Tavish Scott. Likewise, I recognise that future funding of internal ferry services in Orkney and Shetland is less of an immediate concern to those representing communities facing their own pressures and challenges. However, I believe the issue we're debating today does speak to a wider interest we all share. I need to shine a light on the promises made by ministers to communities across Scotland and for this parliament to hold them accountable. I will do. Kate Forbes. As an MSP who also represents Lifeline Services, can I just ask the member who is delivering cheaper fares for ferry routes to Orkney and Shetland next year and who has delivered it for the Western Isles? Well, Liam MacArthur. Absolutely. After 10 years uh, of making the case where those fares uh, were introduced on the West Coast to the competitive disadvantage uh, and with no good reason not in the Northern Isles. However, I believe the issue we're debating today does speak to that wider interest. On that basis, I hope Parliament will support the motion today and reject Hamza Yusuf's request in his amendment to be allowed to keep kicking the can down the road for years to come. The attitude by this government is entirely cynical. It's holding communities to ransom over lifeline links, as Jamie Halker Johnson's amendment rightly suggests. In truth, some of our most fragile communities rely utterly on the connections provided by Orkney ferries. For around 15% of Orkney's population, including the island of Sandy, where I had the privilege of growing up, these ferries are the primary means of transporting people and freight while enabling access to essential services, including health and education. It's no exaggeration to say that without these services, or in the event of them having to be scaled back, some communities in my constituency simply could not survive. Of course, the Finance Secretary knows this. As a former Transport Minister, he is well aware how crucial these specific ferry services are. He also knows that the current model is, uh, of provision is unsustainable. He and Mr Youssef have heard it time and again from myself and Tavish Scott. They've heard it directly, repeatedly and in detail from the local councils in Orkney and Shetland over the years. And not so long ago, the message appeared to be getting through. Faced with a backlash in the islands against centralisation and demands from Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles for more de decision-making powers, the Scottish Government was forced to act. So it was that in June 2014, the former First Minister swept into Orkney with all due pomp and ceremony to declare his government, quote, understands the significant financial challenges that can fall on individual local authorities and is committed to the principle of fair funding in the provision of ferries and ferry infrastructure. It was as if there was a referendum pending and islanders to placate. In hindsight, we should have had Mr uh, Salmond carve it into one of our standing stones. Yet even after the referendum was lost, the promise held. On 26 November 2014, in this chamber, the then Transport Minister Derek Mackay assured me the provision of transport services should not place a disproportionate financial burden on any council, particularly with reference to revenue support for ferry services and ferry replacement costs for internal ferry services. So are these services placing a disproportionate financial burden on Orkney and Shetland Island councils? 
Emphatically, yes, Deputy Presiding Officer. Running the internal in ferry service in, in Orkney accounts for 14% of the Council's total annual budget. Unlike similar services elsewhere in Scotland, however, the Government only funds 40% of these costs. This leaves Orkney in debt to the tune of £5.5 million a year. For Scotland's smallest council, already facing uh, having to deal with £12 million of budget shortfall over the next four years, the consequences are potentially horrendous. Deep cuts to health, care, education and other core services, including lifeline ferries. Some argue that Orton OIC should simply dip deeper into its reserves. Yet the same ask is not made of others whose lifeline ferry services are funded by government. Moreover, imagine the reaction, for example, if Highlands Council were invited to raid their common good fund uh, to run the rail services north of Inverness. And these are not Rolls-Royce ferry services in Orkney, far from it. The government's own ferries plan from 2012 showed that on cost, frequency and capacity, island communities in Orkney are being shortchanged. This is not a, a criticism of Orkney ferries. But with ministers signing off further pay increases for Carmack employees, the current disparity with counterparts in Orkney ferries is set to grow bigger. As a consequence, industrial action on Orkney's internal ferry network is now a distinct possibility, threatening the island communities who depend on the services and underscoring the urgency of getting this sorted. That's why the government must now honour the commitment Derek Mackay made in 2014, repeated by Hamza Youssef in March last year, to deliver fair ferry funding for the Northern Isles. There's an opportunity in the budget next week to do just that, through direct funding. You can Members, please, last your, minute. You can pick this up in winding up. Through direct funding, through the GA, uh, through direct funding rather than through GAE. It's an opportunity Derek Mackay must take if he's to have any credibility. If he does not, if he continues to hold people in Orkney and Shetland to Absolutely. ransom, yeah, any yeah. trust in him, the Transport yeah. Minister, or this government will have been lost. Ministers must be held accountable for the promises they make, and Parliament has a responsibility to ensure this happens. I move and urge Parliament to support the motion in my name. I call Hamza Yousaf to speak to and move Amendment 9379.2 up to six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I do welcome uh, this debate, Presiding Officer. A good chance to put on record all of the good things and great things that we're doing for our Scottish islands, including, of course, uh, Orkney and Shetland. Uh, Lee MacArthur started um, what I thought was a generally actually un ungracious and uh, un unfair uh, contribution to this like Parliament, uh, which is unlike him, uh, of course, yeah. talking uh, about promises. I, I do have to say, Presiding Officer, I find it difficult <laughs> taking a lecture on keeping promises from the Lib Dems, uh, but nonetheless, I'll soldier Absolutely. on. This government's current priority and its manifesto commitment, its promise, was of course to reduce ferry fares and services between the Scottish mainland yeah. to Orkney and Shetland, in line with, as I say, our 2016 uh, commitment, uh, manifesto commitment. Uh, on the 22nd of August of this year, I announced that ferry fares to Orkney and Shetland will be significantly reduced in the first half of 2018. I know that's something that Lee MacArthur and his colleagues uh, will welcome. Reductions will be delivered on ferry services between the mainland and Northern Isles in the first half of 2018 through the rollout of road equivalent tariff and an RET variant, which will see, uh, for, the, for the record, foot passenger fares cut by an average of more than 40%, while car fares will be reduced by an average of more than 30% on the Petland Firth routes and on the routes from Aberdeen to Kirkwall and Lerwick. In addition, we're also, of course, taking forward uh, real tangible practical measures in our islands, bill committed to improving outcomes for everyone who lives and works on our islands. Evidence of this can be found in the suite of commitments contained within that bill. Turning to the issue at, at hand, the Scottish Government has, of course, treated local government very fairly, despite the cuts to the Scottish budget from the UK Government. Taking this year's local government finance settlement, not just now, I'll make some progress. Uh, the, taking this year's local government finance settlement, plus the additional 160 million announced on the 2nd of February and other sources, of support available through the actual potential increase in council tax income and the support through health and social care integration, the overall increase in spending power to support local authority services amounts to over 400 million or 3.9 in cash terms. Now, the, 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 minute, the, the member is right, I'll just make some progress on this. The member is absolutely right that there are, of course, specific and special needs uh, for those that live on islands. Uh, so when it comes to islands and funding, there is, of course, a special islands need allowance. Orkney Island Council receives 5.8 million. Shetland Island Council uh, receives 5.7 million. I give way to Graham Simpson. 
Graeme Simpson. Excuse me, Mr. Simpson, your microphone's not on. I can see from here your card isn't in. Press your button. Oh, you've done. You're, You're fine. You're right, as always, uh, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I couldn't help laughing when the Minister said that local government uh, had been treated fairly. But the revenue, revenue budget for local government has gone down year on year. There have been 30,000 job cuts across local government uh, since this government's been in power. And COSLA says they need £540 million just to stand still. How is that being treated fairly? Hamza, you said... Well, he shouldn't be laughing because, of course, it's his party colleagues down in Westminster that are reducing the resource budget over the next two years by £500 million. Pounds. So he shouldn't be laughing. But let's, let's stick to the issue at hand, if I can. Uh, let me stress that Orkney Islands Council and Shetland Island Council are, of course, currently responsible for their internal ferry services. We have never pledged to automatically assume these responsibility for these uh, services. Of course, only as of last week, Orkney Island Council have changed their position. Instead of asking for an additional top-up, they have now, uh, in my understanding, requesting a transfer of responsibility, a, a decision that Tavish Scott seems to have described as puzzling. But moving on, the discussions that we've had with both Orkney Island Council and Shetland Island Council have been extremely constructive. They are not my words, but in the meeting that both Derek Mackay and myself uh, chaired, along with the leaders of Island, uh, Orkney Island Council and Shetland Island Council, mm. uh, the leader of Shetland Island Council, Cecil Smith, says that they were the most positive meetings that yeah. he has been in, and yeah. extremely constructive. Uh, and True. James Stockin, the leader of Orkney Island Council, also described those meetings as extremely positive. And in terms of the Scottish Government's responsibility, he talks about the ferries plan, and he, of course, is incorrect and in is, mis in, in, in is mischaracterising uh, the commitments that this government has made. The government has promised to engage constructively on the, transfer of of the, on the transfer of responsibilities. And I'll just quote the exact paragraphs uh, from the ferries plan. On page 12, paragraph 27, it says, agreement would also have to be reached about the levels of capital fund that would form part of any transfer of infrastructure taking account of its current condition and future investment requirement. Page 52 then says, ultimately, however, it may not always be agreed that a transfer of responsibility goes ahead. In addition, the Scottish Government cannot guarantee to be in a position to provide any additional funding. So the commitment is absolutely there to engage in meaningful dialogue and meaningful conversation. In my last few seconds, let me just say this, that there is a window of opportunity for the Liberal Democrat MSPs to either to engage positively in the budget, to have a discussion on this very important issue, to side with their constituents, mm -hmm. or play party politics. And yeah. of course, yeah. I'll be yeah. looking forward to listening to hear what they have to say yeah. uh, in the next eight days. And in the meantime, this government will continue to move forward with our ambitious plans for the islands, right. and not just for the ferry services that of course we fund, but of course for the range of other initiatives that we're taking forward for the well-being of our island communities. Yeah. <laughs> You move your amendment, please, Mr Youssef. Oh, yes, and I move the, amendment, the government's amendment in my name. I now call on Jamie Halcrow-Johnson to speak to and move amendment 9379.1. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to debate this issue here in the Chamber today. From my home in the, on the mainland of Orkney, I can watch the Hoy Head, the ferry which serves the islands of Hoy and Flotter, travel across the waters of Scapa Flow, carrying people to and from the islands every day and in all weathers. For those of us who live in one of Scotland's, on one of Scotland's island's communities, ferries are our lifeline. And that's why, to many of us in Orkney and Shetland, the discussion around ferry funding strikes at the heart of fairness. It was the Scottish Government themselves who, in their own words, made a commitment to fair ferry funding. This commitment, by implication, suggests that the Scottish Government recognised that the existing situation is unfair. Members from several of the opposition parties have challenged the Scottish Government on numerous occasions to outline their plans, but no responses have been forthcoming. So we come to this chamber today looking for clarity on a pledge made by the Scottish Government themselves. Liam MacArthur's motion and his comments today encapsulate that well, pointing to just some of the occasions where commitments to fair funding have been made and repeated, and these pledges are long-standing. Above all in this debate, 
No, I'm, I'm afraid I won't. There's been ample opportunity for you to, uh, to make the position known. Above all in this debate, it's the councils and the people of, the, of Orkney and Shetland who deserve clarity on this issue. That is what I've been seeking from ministers throughout this process. We know action on the commitment has, if moving at all, been moving at a snail's pace. But more than, I think the government have an ample opportunity to provide clarity. More than that, we barely know what the commitment means or how the Scottish government intends to deliver it. To give some impression of the Scottish Government's approach in recent months, when I raised it with the Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing in the Chamber on the 2nd of November, he instead chose to answer a question about the ferries which run between the mainland of Scotland and the Northern Isles. And today's Scottish Government amendment seeks to do the same, to distract attention away from the issue at hand, the need for clarity on fair ferry funding of the Isles of the Internal Ferries by trying to focus on again the same ferries which run between the mainland of Scotland and, Northern, and the Northern Isles. I then sought clarity from the Transport Minister himself, writing to Humza Yusuf on the 6th of November. I received an acknowledgement on the 16th of November. Today, on the 6th of December, I'm still waiting a substantive reply. Those who live, uh, those who live on the islands that make up the Northern Isles deserve reliable and sustainable ferry services in the future. They are vital lifeline connections, serving communities with, where there are often transport alternatives are not available, or where they are, they're prohibitively expensive. And the economic and social benefits the internal ferries bring to the islands cannot be overstated. The farmer or crofter who uses the ferry to take his produce to the mart, the company that relies on the ferry to, to export their products or services to their customers, the GP who uses ferries to reach patients or connected practices, the elderly person frequently crossing to access medical services or whose care has traveled to provide services to those they look after on the islands, children and young people who travel daily to access secondary education, their college or apprenticeships. This is not simply about transport. It's about ensuring our islands have vibrant and diverse communities, communities with a long-term future. Over the years, we have heard much from the Scottish Government about the sustainability of rural... I'm just in my last bit. Over the years, we have heard much from the Scottish Government about the sustainability of rural and remote communities. Yet here, where we, we can put action behind their rhetoric, we get only delay and distraction. Orkney and Shetland are a long way from Edinburgh. And their interests often, often seem drowned out against the cacophony of larger and louder and closer mainland local authorities. But the Northern Isle authorities have done the right thing. They have worked together. They have worked with the opposition parties and those of us who represent them. They have lobbied government. They have made their case. Excuse they have made me, Mr. Harcrow Johnson. Could we have less of the double acts on the front bench, please? Thank you. Mr. Harcrow Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. They have made their case, and they have brought it to the attention of this Parliament and to this Government, aided by those of us from the islands who recognise only too well the importance of their case. They deserve to be heard, and they and the people of Orkney and Shetland they represent deserve to be told what the Scottish Government's plans are on the issue that is of vital importance to their island's future. Now is the opportunity for the Scottish Government to provide clarity on how it intends to meet its own commitments to fair ferry funding, to recognise the potentially devastating impact of their obfuscation on this issue, and to accept the vital lifeline nature of Orkney and Shetland's internal ferries. Deputy Presider, Presiding Officer, I move the amendment in my name. I call Neil Bibby. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour welcome this debate from the Liberal Democrats. I also declare I'm a member of the Unite Trade Union and a member of the RMT Parliamentary Group. This debate today is about two important and related issues the way in which Scottish Government funds local government and the way in which Interrail Island Ferry Services in Orkney and Shetland are funded and provided. And I can just say, in relation to local government finance, Hamza Yusuf said that local government had been uh, fairly funded and he commented that people had laughed, but I think that was a laughable statement because since 2011, £1.5 billion pounds has been stripped out of council budgets and right now councils across Scotland are preparing for another round of cuts still to come. 1.4 billion pounds of efficiency savings have already had to be found by local authorities since 2012, resulting in the loss of 15,000 full-time equivalent staff across Scotland. And if Mr Mason wants to tell us that council is being fairly funded, on you go, Mr Mason. John Mason. Well, it was actually to ask, if you, if you think count, local council should have £1.5 billion pounds more, should that come off the health service? Neil Bibby. I don't, I don't know if Mr Mason's been paying attention over the past couple of years. Scottish Labour making the argument for using the powers of the Scottish yeah. Parliament to raise revenue, to invest in local services. He, he should really keep up. Um, 
accord and he should also keep up with what Cosler are saying because Cosler have said has already been mentioned they need a 545 million pounds just to stand still this should come no as, as no surprise to John Mason and to the Scottish Government because they've been warned time and time again that their cuts to councils cannot be sustained but for Orkney and Shetland, there are substantial additional costs and liabilities associated with providing inter-island ferry services. Costs and liabilities that Scottish Labour, and indeed, I think, the Scottish Government, uh, do not believe that Orkney and Shetland should put, uh, be put at a disadvantage. Uh, and that's all a part of the Liberal Democrat motion today, because cuts to uh, local councils are cuts to local communities. Yeah, I'll take an intervention from Derek that. Mackay. Is Neil Bibby aware that the negotiations on local government finance are taken in partnership with local government? And whatever you think about the quantum, distribution is a matter of joint agreement yeah. between Scottish government and COSLA. The distribution methodology is only changed if I have an approach from COSLA. Is Neil Bibby suggesting that I make a unilateral decision rather than a traditional manner of engaging with local government and distribution? Neil Bibby. I'm saying that councils should be properly funded and fairly funded, and I'm saying that Orkney and Shetland should be fairly funded for the, the, the lifeline ferry services uh, that they have. Um, you know, we've warned that, uh, and, and you have to take cognizance of that, Cabinet Secretary, because Orkney and Shetland Island Councils are warning you, are warning us, that unless they receive additional funds, that lifeline ferry services could be cut and affected by the cuts. Orkney Ferries carries 320,000 passengers on 20,000 sailings alone uh, last year. That's more than uh, Circle Northlink uh, and Prentland Ferries uh, combined. Orkney and Shetland Councils are, of course, in a unique position. Uh, there are ferries all across uh, Scotland, publicly owned through Transport Scotland services, which attract significantly more funding. And we know from Orkney Isles Council that in 2016-17, there was a shortfall of £2.8 million, £380,000 over their ferry service budget. On top of this, nine vessels in Orkney Ferries fleet have a combined age of 258 years, an average age of nearly 29 years. So an ageing fleet, which will require repairs and replacement, is extremely difficult to see how this will be done without an impact on services. There's also issues regarding pay, uh, and a pay dispute between Orkney Ferries and the recognised trade unions, RMT, Nautilus and Unite, after members rejected uh, the latest employer's pay offer, a dispute that should be resolved, but is looking unlikely to be resolved while working on the current budget. Now, the Transport Minister is well aware of all of these issues. He's made much of the announcement on road uh, equivalent tariff, but he is uh, yet to address the huge capital costs for new vessels and repairs which are currently leaving Orkney and Shetland Island Councils in limbo. And the SNP amendment today provides no clarity other than to keep on talking. Providing the additional funding estimated to be £11.2 million per year needed to run an appropriate ferry service may, of course, only be a short-term solution to this issue. As the RMT trade union point out, serious consideration must be given to the inclusion of inter ferry services in a redrawn contract for Northern Isles ferry services from October 2019, and this option should be assessed as part of the Scottish Government's ongoing ferry law review. Um, the question remains uh, for the Scottish Government, when will they... Uh, come good on the promises that they have made. We don't ha seem to have a firm commitment or answer from Humza Yusuf, and we don't seem to have one from Derek Mackay uh, either. Today, we have no decision from a, go from a government on funding of a major lifeline for the people of Orkney and Shetland. You have to officer, close, please. The people of Orkney and Shetland need and deserve certainty about the future financing of these ferry services. Promises have been made. Now it's time to deliver, and that's why Scottish Labour will support the motion in the name of Liam MacArthur. We now move to the open debate. Four-minute speeches were really tight for time, so I'm going to be particularly narky this afternoon. And I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Kate Forbes. The motion we are debating today is a very straightforward one, one which I would hope every MSP in this chamber should be able to support at decision time this afternoon. Why should I be suggesting that every MSP should be supporting it? Because all it's doing is asking the Scottish Government and the Finance Minister, Derek Mackay in particular, to honour the commitments already made to Orkney and Shetland Islanders. And I'm glad, I've just started, I'm glad to see Derek Mackay in the chamber. It's good to see him here. He knows that when he was Transport Minister, he answered a parliamentary question from my colleague, Liam MacArthur, on the 26th of November, when he said, 
provision of transport services, and this bears repeating, should not place a disproportionate financial burden on any council, particularly with reference to revenue support for ferry services. However, as I understand it, and there is an opportunity now to correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mackay has appeared to abandon that commitment as he does not intend including the funding in next week's budget. I recently visited Orkney with the other members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. We were there as part of the process of taking stage one evidence on the Scottish Government's Islands Bill. Now there is much to be said for the Islands Bill, but there is a real concern amongst islanders that the bill, if it becomes an act of parliament, may not actually lead to any real change, and it may just be warm words. But the Scottish Government could have signalled right now that it does intend to promote real change for island life by supporting this motion this afternoon. Only if you're going to say you're going to be supporting the motion and giving them the money. Is that going to be the case? If I'm happy to do that, but obviously if he's not going to, he can sit down. However, judging by the Scottish Government's amendment, it would seem that they want to well, listen. It would seem that they want to wriggle out of their commitments. But Deputy Presiding Officer, this wriggle work room, it will not work. Their amendment deserves to be defeated. It should be seen for what it is, a poor attempt to pull the wool. The government hasn't even got the courage, hasn't even got the courage to attempt to change the Liberal Democrat motion. They know that if they were in the right, I, I said before, I'm more than happy to take an intervention if the government will give Orkney and Shetland the money it has promised them. They would have tried, as I said, Deputy Presiding Officer, they obviously don't want to give Orkney and Shetland the money. They don't want to honour the commitments they've made. They've got the opportunity now, and I've invited them several times to do so, and they won't do it. They know that they, if, if they were in the right, they would have tried to change our motion this afternoon. They're simply trying to dodge the issue yet again, and we've seen it on the front bench by trying to swamp the motion with other issues. I'm in my last minute. It's quite plain that there's no intervention being taken. Minister, there is no wriggle room here. If the Scottish Parliament does support the motion this afternoon, then the obvious next step for the government would be to include a financial provision in next week's budget to honour the pledges it has already made. Words must be followed by action. If the Scottish Government continues to talk the talk but not walk the walk, then it isn't just the people of the Orkney and Shetland Islands that will notice. Deputy Presiding Officer, this will have repercussions throughout Scotland. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As this was headlined a finance debate for good measure, may I remind the Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, who I see is in the Chamber. Um, and it's clearly a debate of significant interest to him if anybody would just let him intervene. As an MSP for island communities, I share much of the sentiment of Liam MacArthur's motion, and I agree with the points he made about our constituents' dependence on lifeline routes. I'm the representative of islands too, and I firmly believe that rural residents should have access to equitably priced products and services. That's why I'm speaking in this debate. And I'll happily thank anybody who brings forward debates on matters of importance to the people of the Highlands and Islands. Because those principles of equity and fair funding are especially acute when it comes to transport, as a ferry fare is the extra cost that's always tacked on to the holiday, the education trip, the hospital visit, the um, shopping trip or spending time with family and friends. But evidently the Scottish Government gets that too as the Minister is honouring the promise in our manifesto in 2016 to reduce ferry fares on services to Orkney and Shetland, as they've already done for my West Coast constituents. And so in advance of the rollout of road equivalent tariff in early 2018, which is really not far away at all, and an RET variant, I can say unequivocally that RET has made a tremendous difference to my island-based constituents as ferry fares have plummeted. And it will no doubt make just as much of a difference to Mr. MacArthur and Mr. Scott's constituents. And that is good news. It was the SNP who delivered RET on the West Coast routes, and it will be the SNP who slashes fares on the Northern Isles routes. 
That is a promise delivered. And incidentally, and with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance here, incidentally, it is budget time again, which isn't just my favourite time of the year, but also an opportunity for every party in this chamber. Clearly and understandably, internal ferry fares continue to be of concern to the people of Orkney and Shetland. And the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is in the House, and he's listening. So with the obvious caveat that internal ferries is a matter for the Council, for the councils, there is no better time than the week before the Scottish Government publishes its budget to talk about spending priorities. And the more support for the Highlands and Islands, the better. I agree with Liam MacArthur, but I have a question for him. If the money for internal ferry fares was in the budget, would he vote for it? Or will he vote against it like he and his colleagues voted against extra funding for education in last year's budget and funding for broadband and for house building and for further empowerment of island communities. Every party in this chamber has the opportunity to deliver actual, real, tangible change by working with the Cabinet Secretary on the budget. And ultimately, the question is this. For the Liberal Democrats and for every other party in this chamber that's spoken on this motion, when it comes to internal ferry fares in the budget, will it be party or constituency? Tom Mason, followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. For many thousands of people living in our islands and coastal communities, ferry transportation represents a vitally important resource that is necessary for day-to-day -day living. From going to work or school, to improving economic activity through the movement of goods and, and services, and all the way to delivering public services such as policing and healthcare. Ferries are the utmost relevance when discussing improvement to the lives of those in island and rural communities. And this is not to mention the massive boost that many thousands of tourists provide each year to local econ economies. So the benefit of these services is therefore clear to see. I was pleased to read in the Audit Scotland's report this October that of the ferry services they considered that after accounting for adverse weather, weather some 99.7% of scheduled sailings last year took place and that 99.6% of those sailings were on time, better than ScotRail. I would like to pay tribute to all those who would work tirelessly to maintain these high performance standards throughout the year. Now, the Finance Secretary is committed to what he describes as fair funding. And whilst this is admirable, I'm not alone in today in recognising there are questions to be asked in relation to the implementation of that commitment. Indeed, the joint statement from the leaders of Orkney and Shetland Islands Council has explained that without an appropriate resolution, there's almost certainly that the ferry services will have to be reduced. It cannot be overstated how grave the consequences of this would be for our island communities. We need much more in the way of clarity from the Scottish Government as to how it will indeed intend to address this issue, to prevent a situation where the sustainability of service provision is called into question. I also note the disparity in funding mechanism between the ferry transport provided in Western Isles and that provided by North Scotland. While services in Orkney and Shetland are designated as non-subsidised ferry services, but their equivalents in the West are subsidised by Transport Scotland without any need for local authority. In... No, thank you. You have your say later. We cannot say that this situation is close to fair. I think the Finance Secretary needs to clearly set out his approach to this as it is a fundamental issue when determining if the funding settlement is truly fair and equitable to all that rely on these services across Scotland. Unfortunately, until now, the silence from the Scottish Government has been deafening. These communities and their lifeline services serve better, and delaying tactics were here, have seen all too often from ministers. No. They deserve, their fair, they deserve their fair access to the opportunities that our economy can provide, and the working with our island councillors to address those sustainability issues would be a good first step. In closing, presiding officer, Commitments made by the Scottish Government for the funding of the ferry transportation are so welcome. However, I am concerned that delivery has simply not matched rhetoric. I hope the Finance Secretary will take on board the legitimate issues that both Parliament and stakeholders have identified 
and a term with a solution that properly satisfies all stakeholders. Thank you. Now I have Rhoda Grant, please, followed by John Finney. I'm grateful to the Liberal Democrats for bringing forward this issue in their debating time. It's not a new issue. I've written to the Scottish Government on many occasions over the years about this looming problem, and it's getting more and more serious as time passes. It's therefore incredibly cynical that the Scottish Government now responds by telling MSPs to back the government's budgets, and they'll see what they'll do thereafter. If that's not plain, if that's not plain party politics, I really don't know what is. There is nothing I have heard to... There is nothing I've heard to date that leads me to believe that the Scottish budget will be anything other than catastrophic for these islands and indeed for the rest of Scotland. So much for the pledge, the provision of transport services should not place a disproportionate financial burden on any council, particularly with reference to revenue support for ferry services. This is the same government that are taking an island's bill through the parliament to ensure they are not disadvantaged, but on the other hand refuse to treat them equally. The Scottish Government owned ferry company provides inter-island services for most other council areas. They pro provide them between the Argyll Islands and the mainland and they also provide inter-island services in the Western Isles. A very, very quick intervention. Hamza Youssef. Will she acknowledge, thank the member for giving the intervention, will she acknowledge that Argyll and Butte fund Isla Tadura, Sale, Easdale, Lismore services, Highland Council uh, fund several internal ferries, including the Corran Ferry, and SPT, of course, fund uh, the good at Kilcreggan. So Orkney and Shetland Shire Islands are not the only councils to fund internal ferry services. Will she acknowledge that? Rhoda Grant. But if he'd been listening to me, I said most, not all. Um, so I think it's quite clear that an awful lot of inter-island uh, ferry services are funded by the government. Um, the, fer the ferries in service in Orkney and Shetland are old and long time um, past replacement and frankly they're not fit for purpose. They, some of them don't even have adequate disability access, yet the Scottish Government refused to help. Had they intervened earlier, we would now not have such an urgent problem. Surely it makes sense that if CMA provide ferries to Orkney and uh, ferries to others, they could provide ferries to Orkney and Shetland Islands Council. At the very least, it would provide economies of scale and the ability to share ferries when there was a problem. In other areas, CalMac also run ferry services. Again, this is something that could be replicated through all our islands. islands. The wages paid to staff in these inter-island ferry services are also out of line with those paid for similar jobs elsewhere. They are significantly less than those paid by CalMac for, to their staff for providing a similar service. I understand that there is real concern that ferry workers will take in industrial action because of this, and no one disputes that they're underpaid compared with others doing a similar job. However, the councils tell us that they do not have the resources to pay them fairly. The Scottish Government, in their amendment, talk about um, the services between Orkney, Shetland and the mainland, but there are also concerns with them um, uh, regarding freight costs and the capacity for freight from the Northern Isles to the mainland. While passenger fares are being reduced, other costs are rising, including freight and uh, access to berths on those ferries. In reality, that's a tax on every, every um, islander and goods coming from the islands as well. If this government are committed to supporting island communities, they must take the lead and provide them with a level playing field and redress the disadvantage that living on an island creates. Cuts in local government funding from the Scottish Government is making the situation worse. Therefore, rather than posturing, it would be much more fitting for the Scottish Government to honour their previous promises and find a way of providing high-quality inter-island ferry services for those people living on those islands. Failure to do so would show that this government has no interest in island proofing or supporting our islands other than warm words and little action. The Scottish Government now needs to, need to honour their commitment to the Northern Isles. We call John Finney to be followed by John Mason. Uh, th thank you, President Officer. Uh, I declare an interest as a member of the RMT Parliamentary Group and I'd, I'd like to thank Lib Dem colleagues for bringing this a motion forward today and thank various people for briefings, not least my hard-working Green councillor and colleague, um, Councillor Steve Sanky. Um, Sanky. Um, now, uh, we don't live in an equal world and to treat people uh, uh, 
equally and fairly. We, it doesn't mean we treat them the same, but in this particular issue, we neither have equality or similarity. Uh, we will be supporting, the Scottish Green Party will be supporting this motion at, at, at decision time tonight. And I don't know what the maritime equivalent of the long grass is, Minister, but that's how, uh, I have to say, um, the, the Scottish Government motion appears to, to, to us. Now, th there are, there are a, a number of ferry issues as a representative of the Highlands and Islands. Um, there's the issue of Corn Ferry, which has been alluded to. There's the issue of uh, the, the Cochrane Ferry has been an issue too. There's the aspirations of people in Dunoon regarding the ferry there. But of course, the big difference in each of these is that none of these routes are lifeline routes. So similarly, we will be supporting the Conservative Amendment, which talks about the recognition that these are vital lifeline links, which provide considerable social and economic benefits to the communities that they serve. And I think that can't be lost. Now, um, both islands' uh, councils want what's best, and I, I've met with the, the conveners and leaders, um, and um, I know there's consideration of the, the transfer to Transport Scotland. That's not a, a, a position the Scottish Green Party would like to see, I have to say. If that's what ultimately it turns out and it's adequately funded, that's good. But we want to see local operation of these ferries by the local authorities. That's the appropriate way forward. And um, for not the first time I'm going to talk about £6 billion pound expenditure in two roads, three quarters of a billion pound expenditure in relation, in relation to the M8. And, you know, government's about decisions, about choices, and politics is about choices. And I have to say, in relation to uh, the duelling of the A9 and the A96, you enjoy the support of all the other parties in the, in the Parliament. You do not enjoy my support, as you know, Minister. Um, but I want to compare and contrast these options here, because if you take the situation of travel between our capital city and our largest city, the number of rail options that there are there, um, if you consider that the bus service enjoys a subsidy as well, and we have to start thinking in terms of the subsidy that's on the road, yet... If you're on um, uh, Hoy or Halsey trying to go to the mainland of your islands, it's your local authority that's paying for that. Now, try asking, and I know someone did suggest Highland Council utilise the Common Good Fund for road building. I'm, I'm taking it that was a tongue-in-cheek suggestion. There isn't parity. There isn't equality. Now, of course, it would be churlish not to acknowledge what's been said in relation to the Northern uh, Isles, to the, the mainland ferries. That's acknowledged. But it is about choices, and I, I think there are factors that are important as well here, and, and my colleague uh, uh, Rhoda Grant alluded to one of them, that is the suitability of the fleet. I have to say I find it distinctly embarrassing that um, something that wouldn't be considered DDA compliant is being operated um, in the public sector uh, in Scotland. Yes, I will. Very quickly, Hamza well, Yusuf. On the basis of understanding that these are the responsibilities, for example, of Orkney, Orkney Island Council, does he not find it it's strange to attack the Scottish Government for the fact that Orkney Island Council haven't built a new ferry since 1996. John Finney. There's a lot of talk about the building of military vessels here. There's lots of options for the construction of, of, uh, of, of ferries. The Rassi ferry is an option that I, I thought might be, which is plugged in and use renewable energy at night. I'm told, I'm told, Minister, I'm told that that's unsuitable for the waters between the islands there. And I better get the terminology right. Hydro hybrids and hydrogen for the Orkney ones from the turbines in Westray, Rousey and Chappensey. Now, what better than that? There are decisions that to be made, and I hope the decisions will be made that meet the entire interests and reasonable aspirations of the residents of the Northern Isles. Thank you. And the last of the open debate contributions is John Mason. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I would just like to clearly state how important I consider islands to be to Scotland. I'm a mainland MSP. In fact, I'm a city MSP. But I do love the islands, and I think we as a country, and that includes the central belt of Scotland, have a responsibility for ensuring that our islands and other remote areas are in a healthy state. I believe this is not just a duty or responsibility, but we all benefit from having so many islands. They are a key part of our heritage as a country, and they are part of what defines us as a nation. I do have to say, I think it's a little bit sneaky of the Lib Dems calling this a finance debate and then focusing on internal island ferry services. We should maybe just then call every debate a finance debate on the grounds that there will always be a financial angle to anything and everything we discuss in here. However, I personally am certainly happy to take part in this debate, firstly because I have a personal interest in islands and I think I've used the internal island ferries, if memory serves me correctly, to Yale and Unst and Bressey and Fair Isle and Hoy and Rousey and Chappensey and Westray and Papa Westray. I might have missed one. 
And secondly, as Mike Rumble suggested, because the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, of which I'm also a member, has been visiting islands in recent months and uh, has in fact visited Orkney as well. So to touch on the Islands Bill, I think we have to be clear that the legislation does not promise new funding for islands in the bill. But perhaps its main aim is to make us all think more about islands and take them into consideration whatever subject we are considering, be that education, sport, transport or whatever. So from that point of view, I think today's debate does fit in well with the bill. The formal wording of raising the island's profile is called an island impact assessment, although this is somewhat loosely called island proofing. I feel that the, the, I have to say that the term island proofing is not a good description, firstly because it might suggest that somehow it's bad to be in an island and you've got to be protected from something, and it in many ways ignores the benefits of island life, which islanders have been clear to tell us about, but secondly, because I'm afraid the extra costs and the remoteness from some services are never going to be fully removed or proofed against. The bill is fairly high level, but on the islands we visited, I think on every occasion, transport was the main topic that was raised with us by local folk. And in Orkney, that certainly included the inter-island services. Clearly, it is more expensive to live on islands when travel to the mainland is taken into account. And that extra cost increases again for those living in an island other than the main island. One example for us was a youngster from Rousey, I think, who wanted to play rugby in Kirkwall, but had to stay there overnight on bed and breakfast because the ferries did not run late enough. Now, I have to say, when I was in Shetland, eh, I found the ferry fares pretty inexpensive, and in fact, I was amazed at how little it cost me to get eh, a boat to Fair Isle. Eh, however, I do accept that the ferry will only be part of the journey and if you need to other transport as well, the costs start to mount up. Uh, can I thank Orkney Islands Council specifically for their briefing? And I think we all do accept that there are financial challenges facing the islands on ferries. The suggestion that the Scottish Government could take over all ferry services in return for a reduced grant to the island councils, I think should be considered, as it certainly does sound attractive on the surface. However, the downside might be a loss of local control and, for example, we heard in Mull the dissatisfaction that there was no direct ferry from Mull to Col and Tyree, despite their close proximity. So that lack of local control would need to be considered. I also think it's important uh, that we, when we're thinking about other ferries in Scotland other than Calmac and Northlink, that we do remember other uh, council and independently run ferries, some of which I would suggest are lifeline, because if money is going to be found for Orkney and Shetland, I think it has to be found for some of these other services as well. Finally, in finance, island authorities do get more per head than mainland authorities do, and that's rightly so. If there's to be extra money found for island ferries, it has to come from somewhere, and uh, we have not had a lot of suggestions this afternoon where it would come from. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call James Kelly. No more than four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's uh, Lib Dem debate and, sp and indeed speak in, in support of the Lib Dem motion. I think this is a, really it's quite a straightforward debate in many ways. The Lib Dems have brought forward uh, a demand essentially that the government honour previously made commitments about fair funding of ferry services to Orkney and Shetlands and the parliamentary debate should be about does parliament uh, accept that demand or not. Uh, it's a reasonable demand. The, the reason it's been brought forward is that as many of the speakers across all sides have acknowledged, ferries play an important part in the country, not only uh, in terms of links uh, between mainland and, and islands and between islands, um, but also supporting local people and supporting local economies. Uh, as Neil Bibby pointed out, in terms of Orkney, there are 300 and uh, there's, there's 20,000 sailings um, per year carrying 320,000 passengers. So that shows you the scale of the operation uh, in Orkney alone. I think in terms of the, the government's response, as Rhoda Grant noted, it's been particularly disappointing. What we've had um, in terms of the, uh, the, the amendment is really like a, a kind of wonder around the whole lot of other issues. It's as if uh, Hamza Youssef, the minister, is auditioning for a role at the Scottish Stor Storytelling Centre. Uh, as he tells us a number of stories rather than deal with the actual issue that the Lib Dems have brought uh, to the chamber. So I think there's, there's an element of 
there's an element of disappointment in that. Um, I think in the, it also shows, um, a sense, in a sense, how the government go about doing business. You know, as Liam MacArthur said, this goes back to June 2014, um, when the former First Minister visited the islands and made, and made, and made this promise. Um, yes, OK. Derek Mackay. I appreciate uh, James Kelly taking the intervention. Who does James Kelly think is better positioned to say what was the content of those meetings? The politicians trying to score cheap political points or the member of the government who was in the room yeah. every step of the way in negotiating the position with the council leaders who are very satisfied with the progress that they are making. The question they have is, why are their constituency members letting them down? James Kelly. The, the facts of the matter are, Mr Mackay, as Lee MacArthur outlined on two occasions, first of all by Alex Salmond in June 2014, uh, and then followed up later in the year by yourself, the, you committed to a fair funding settlement. And if you're, if you're challenging that, yeah. go on your feet and tell us that you didn't, you didn't commit to a fair funding settlement. Yeah. Derek McKay. What uh, was committed to in the island's prospectus and then subsequent manifestos on which this government was elected on specifically on inter-island ferries that we would engage in meaningful negotiations with the councils which is exactly what we've done and the question they're asking is why are their constituency members not supporting such an insertion in the budget that they would support if that was put in the budget. You have 30 seconds left, Mr. Well, there yeah. you have it. There's only one thing to say, Deputy President Officer. There you have it. Another SNP U-turn. <laughs> in summing up, Deputy President Officer, as I said at the start, the Lib, Dem, the, Lib, the Lib Dem MSPs have brought forward a simple demand to this chamber that the SNP have simply tried to talk it out. Parliament and the people of the islands deserve better than that. They deserve respect and they deserve a fair funding settlement. I call Jamie Green. No more than four minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, if you want to be really well known, go and live in the most solitary place on earth, on an island where there are, where there are no secrets. I'm paraphrasing the words of the famous travel writer Henry Morton. Uh, Scotland is a unique part of the UK in that we host the majority of our island communities, communities which contribute to our economy, heritage and culture. Orkney and the Shetland Islands are unique in the Scottish landscape too. Now, secrets there may not be, but there is always one thing the local people will want to talk about, and that's ferries. Now, whilst we celebrate the unique contribution that these communities make to life in Scotland, let's not forget the unique challenges that they face too. The issue of transportation to and from the mainland, as well as inter-island travel, is about much more than a blether over a bitter in the bothy. The debate today has illustrated quite well the social and economic importance of island connectivity. Getting from A to B affects tourism and inward migration, repopulation, access to economic markets, access to education, health and social care. And how we approach ferry infrastructure and funding is arguably arguably the most striking part of how we look after our islands. Now, the motion today is an important one because it asks the Scottish Government for greater transparency on its plans for, in its own words, fair funding. The Scottish Government committed to the principle of fair funding. However, very little detail has been given since this position was outlined in their Empowering Scotland's Island Communities document three years ago. My colleague Jamie Halco Johnson said this is not simply about transport either. This is about preservation and indeed the cultivation of these diverse communities on our islands. We, uh, we don't often talk about the importance of inter-island trading, but we know that if it's hampered and if you don't have a way to transport goods and people from one to another, Tom Mason illustrated this well when he talked about the potential impact of reducing inter-island services. Uh, Deputy Zardin Austin, summing up, I like to include constructive uh, contributions from across the chamber uh, in these debates and I did reserve a page in my speech for constructive SNP contributions. Members will see that it speaks for itself today. Nothing but excuse after excuse after excuse. Deputy Brian Officer, I know that uh, as a, a member for the West of Scotland region, I know the enormous difficulties that island residents face 
when services are disrupted, which is why we've added specific wording uh, to this motion around the fact that these ferry services are lifeline links. It seems like an obvious statement to make, but alongside aviation, ferries remain the vital connector. Despite being paramount to the future of our island communities, Scotland ferries are suffering from a severe lack of direction. And this was noted by Audit Scotland, who recently said that to date there is no Scotland-wide ferry strategy. Now, transport, uh, transparency is critical here, which is the basis of the Lib Dem motion. The Scottish Government should lay out its proposals both for the future structuring of Scottish ferry routes, but also its funding. Now, in 2016, transport... I'm in my last uh, seconds. You can perhaps respond to that in your summing up. Now, in 2016, Transport Scotland announced a stag-style report into internal ferries. To my knowledge, no conclusions have been publicly released. Uh, perhaps the Minister can explain why. Island residents, ferry operators themselves and businesses deserve to have clarity over their future so they can plan ahead. Local authorities, already challenged by budgets, also require certainty. We share OIC and SIC's concerns. The Scottish Government has made public commitments over ferry funding. The Lib Dem motion asks them to set out how it intends to honour those commitments. We support that motion. Uh, we await the Government's response with bated breath. I call Hamza Youssef. No more than five minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I would stress once again that this Government's priority and promise uh, was, of course, to reduce ferry fares and services between the Scottish mainland uh, to Orkney and Shetland in line with our 2016 uh, manifesto commitment. I know this might be novel to a number of parties, including, of course, Lib Dems, but we intend to honour uh, our commitments and promises in our manifesto, and that is exactly what we have done. Let's address the central point and the central issue, because time uh, is, of course, short. Uh, Mike Rumbles said uh, you can fix this next week. Uh, Liberal Democrat constituency members for Orkney and Shetland said it's all about finance. Uh, let's make it very clear right here, right now. Can they intervene and tell me that if money for internal ferries for Orkney and Shetland are in the budget in eight days' time, will they support it? Will they support it? They can intervene. Complete and utter silence from the Liberal Democrats who will put their party yeah. position uh, ahead can we stop this of their right own now, constituencies. How interesting is that? Can we stop this right now, Mr Yusuf, please? Presiding officer. Right. If there's to be an intervention, please stand up and offer to make an intervention. Please do not shout from a sedentary position. And that is telling, presiding officer, that they're not standing to intervene. I would give them the chance to right now put their constituency interest ahead Tavish of Scott. their... I'm intensely grateful to the Minister for giving way. Uh, will he put it in the budget next week, yes or no? Hamza Yusuf. That was not an answer to the question of would he vote for it if it was in the budget. So that tells you everything, and that will play, not play down well, yes, I have to exactly. say, in Orkney, exactly. our in Shetland. Let's uh, also talk about some of the other issues that were mentioned. Uh, it was somehow suggested that Orkney and Shetland are treated uh, uniquely or unfairly uh, in that sense, not similar to other local authorities. Can I put again on the record once again that it's not only Orkney and Shetland that fund internal ferry services. Uh, Guyland Butte uh, fund a number of internal ferry services. Highlands and Islands Council uh, also do so. And SPT, as we've heard uh, already in this chamber before, uh, fund Gurick uh, and Kilcreggan. Let me also address some of the central point here about what was promised and what was committed to. Uh, we have a trio of transport ministers on the front bench here. At least a couple of us were involved and have been involved in these discussions as recently, of course, as just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And as we sat in that conversation with the leaders of Orkney, with the leaders of Shetland Island Council, myself and Derek Mackay, mm -hmm. promised to continue dialogue constructively. And the answer back, the response from the leader of Shetland Island Council, as reported uh, in the Shetland News Online, any of you can check this, says by Cecil Smith, I am more optimistic than I have ever been before. He says of Derek Mackay, he took on board and I think the meeting has been more positive than I could have thought. So therefore, the dialogue is continuing in a constructive manner. The only people playing party politics with this, of course, are the Liberal Democrats. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, of course. Jamie Green. I thank the Minister for taking intervention. Uh, you, the Minister talks about constructive dialogue. The promise 
uh, was made in 2014. There was further updates in 2015, 2016, we're now at the end of 2016, 2017. How long is it going to take this constructive dialogue that he talks about? Hamza Youssef. Well, of course, it's not. we say very clearly in the Ferries Plan, I've quoted to him page 12, page 52, if he wants, paragraph 4. Uh, of course, we are promising constructive dialogue, but the, ultimately the responsibility for fair funding lies with Orkney or Shetland Council. And I don't understand if Jamie uh, Green uh, can't have a tad bit of shame uh, for standing there and demanding that we spend more while we cut taxes yeah. and while he cuts the yeah. Scottish yeah. Government's yeah. budget by £500 million over yeah. the next two years. Yeah. So, Presiding Officer, we're going to continue yeah. with the great initiatives that we're taking forward for island communities. Well, that's, of course, fulfilling our manifesto commitment of reducing ferry fares uh, from the mainland to uh, Orkney and Shetland, whether it's the Islands Housing Fund, which is helping to tackle that issue of depopulation across the islands, whether it's taking forward an historic Islands Bill, which yeah. some members uh, here have been uh, rather negative about, which I'm surprised about because it's viewed very positively, I have to say, uh, on the islands where I have travelled. And we'll continue that constructive uh, dialogue with the leaders of Orkney and Shetland Council. And on my final remarks, let me just say to Liam and Tavish once again uh, that they can side with their constituencies and engage positively as the leaders of Orkney and Shetland Island Council have, or they can choose to play party politics, and I sincerely hope they choose to engage positively. So our collective ambition in this chamber, no doubt, is to see our island's communities thrive. We'll continue, of course, to move forward with that ambition. I hope other political parties will join us in doing so. I call on Tavish Scott to conclude this debate. You take us up to decision Thank time, Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Well, I couldn't be anything as good at playing party politics as Derek Mackay and Humza Youssef after that performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, Michael Anderson's guardian angel will land boxes of whitefish at Culliveau in Yale this week. The catch is trucked to Lerwick and finishes in French and Spanish markets. Haddock and Cod, part of Scott Shetland's annual £300 million of seafood exports, is exported because, presiding officer, because of the inter-island ferries. Those ferries carry people, freight and, yes, fish to the Shetland mainland. Only then can, be the, can they be ferried to Aberdeen and beyond. So to those who ask why is Parliament debating local ferries this afternoon, that is the answer. Government cannot have and cannot talk about a food and drink strategy unless the products that make up such a strategy, fish, salmon and mussels, can get to the market. And that happens because of inter-island ferries. As Liam MacArthur has explained, as our motion explains, nationalist ministers have accepted their financial responsibility. What they've not done is pay. Ferries have become part of the usual nationalist game. Who can they find to take the blame? Messrs Mackay and Yusuf have spent the past four years, presiding officer, telling islands councillors that all will be well. They have layered on the charm and the double speak. Now, we've heard lots this afternoon never, about never-ending discussions with the islands council. So here is the reality and not the spin that we've had from the front bench. In addition to uh, Liam MacArthur's point about the salmon visit, uh, in 2014. We then had the November 2014 joint statement agreed by the Minister of Transport, which set a target to have fair funding position resolved by mid-2015. And then the crux one is this. On the 10th of March 2016, uh, the leaders of the councils received a letter from the Minister of Transport confirming the understanding of that financial ask, acknowledging the urgency of it and committing, committing, presiding officer, to reaching a fair funding position within five to six months of March 2016. What bit of that have they not answered? What bit of that have they misled the leaders of our councils uh, about? And then finally, and finally, my, the council's advice me that the information on that financial ask has been presented to Transport Scotland to ministers as part of the Transport Scotland budget proposal for 17-18. Uh, I don't think there could be much clearer than that. The discussions are over. There are no discussions still to have. The government knows exactly what they need to do. They should, they should accept. Well, if, if Derek Mackay is going to tell me he's going to put it in a budget, of course I'll give way. Derek Mackay. Thank Tavish Scott for taking the intervention. Of course, there is a window of opportunity between now and the publication of the budget on the 14th of December to respond directly to Tavish Scott. If I put it in the budget, would you vote for it? 
as the leader of Orkney Islands Council said in November, said in November, this government needs to honour its commitment. This council needs to honour its commitment to the Northern Isles Fair funding, rather than playing politics with the issue, which is exactly what Derek Mackay, exactly what Derek Mackay is doing. Uh, I agree with the leader of Orkney Islands Council please. and Order, ask please. Parliament to do the same today. Presiding officer, uh, next Thursday is another acid test of another nationalist policy, island proofing. That means government ensuring what they do takes the island's needs into account. And that's a sensible approach. I agree with that. But Mr Mackay cannot love the principle and then sell out on the practice. And that's what he's going to do next week. This government fund many other uh, local ferries across Scotland. And many other members have raised that point today. And they're right. But our, our argument is that much of the case we have made today does equally apply to other areas as well. And it is right for those members to make that case and to continue, continue to do with it. All of that investment, presiding officer, is absolutely fine if we had a level C, a calm, evidence-based approach to ferries policy. But as always, the SNP play politics with people's livelihoods. The fishermen, fish farmers and other businesses in the outer islands of Orkney and Shetland deserve the same support, not to be discriminated against, but instead to be recognised for their commitment to the wider Scottish economy. So I ask Parliament today to vote for the motion in Liam MacArthur's name, not to kick the issue into the deepest part of the North Sea, which is what the government amendment would do if it was voted for today. If Liam MacArthur's motion wins today, Derek Mackay should accept the will of Parliament and do what he has promised and did in 2016 and make that payment to those councils for that purpose. There is only one final point to make in this debate, presiding officer, and that is this. People, a point that people feel really strongly about, incredibly strongly about in the islands. And I say this to Mr Yusuf, to Mr Mackay and indeed to every minister. When a part of Scotland does not vote for the SNP, rejects independence, that is not a reason for political, economic or financial discrimination. Read the ministerial code. Read the ministerial code. You are there to deliver for all of Scotland. Do not, do not, presiding officer. That's quite enough, please. Do not, <coughs> do not make cynical political calculations on who to support based on their likely voting intentions. Back Liam MacArthur's motion and reject this government amendment. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on finance. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9402 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau, setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 9402. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 9402 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motions 9279, 9280, 9403 and 9404 on approval of SSIs. Move together. Thank you very much. There are a number of questions at decision time. The first, I would remind members, first of all, that the, if the amendment in the name of Michael Matheson is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Claire Baker and John Finney would fall. So the first question is that amendment 9378.4 in the name of Michael Matheson, which seeks to amend motion 9378 in the name of Liam MacArthur on justice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9378.4 in the name of Michael Matheson is yes 59, no 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 9378.1 in the name of Liam Kerr, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liam MacArthur, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. 
We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9378.1 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes 55, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Claire Baker is agreed, then the amendment in the name of John Finney would fall. So the next question is that amendment 9378.3 in the name of Claire Baker which seeks to amend motion 9378 in the name of Liam MacArthur on justice be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9378.3 in the name of Claire Baker is yes 20, no 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 9378.2 in the name of John Finney, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Lee MacArthur on justice be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9378.2 in the name of John Finney is yes 6, no 114. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that a motion 9378 in the name of Liam MacArthur on justice be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division of members who cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9378 in the name of Lee MacArthur is yes 35, no 85. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 9379.2 in, in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend motion 9379 in the name of Lee MacArthur on finance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 9379.2 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes, 60, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore tied. And as Parliament has been unable to reach a view on the amendment, I'll use my casting vote, and in line with uh, previous examples, I will vote against the amendment. So, the next question is that Amendment 9379.1, in the name of Jamie Halcrow Johnson, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liam MacArthur on finance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 9379 in the name of Lee MacArthur as amended on finance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And finally, I propose to ask a single question on four parliamentary bureau motions. If anyone objects, please say so now. No members objected. The question is that motions 9279, 9280, 9403 and 9404 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business. I would just ask members to leave quietly. Members' business will be in the name of Richard Lockhead. We'll take a few moments for members to change seats.